tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's July 2022, and this is episode 295, which is a conversation about the new Disney Plus Star Wars television series, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Today's guest is Cole Burgett, who is a seminary graduate and a contributing writer to the Christian Research Journal, as well as a staff writer for the website Christ and Pop Culture. Cole has written an online exclusive television series review for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Freedom of Forgiveness, and our subscribers can read his web-exclusive review at our website, Equip.org. If you do not already subscribe, please go to Equip.org where you can subscribe for thirty-three fifty, and all of our subscribers get the print issues of the journal straight to their door, as well as get the online exclusive access for our online articles like our exclusive reviews and articles. Cole, it's good to have you on again. Always good to be here. Thank you. Well, of course, as our listeners have heard on this podcast, we've been covering some of the recent series on the Disney Plus channel as the Star Wars universe seems to be expanding. And so I just want to ask Cole to give us a little bit of a background for this particular miniseries about Obi-Wan Kenobi, and even for people who don't know a lot about Star Wars or have never even seen the film, I know they at least know some of the main characters like Luke and Leia and Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. So give us some context, though, about this particular series, because it's been a while since we've seen Obi-Wan Kenobi live action, you know, on a screen, even if it's a small screen in this television series. But where is the particular timeline of this story since we last saw Obi-Wan? I think it was after episode, I'm talking about the younger Obi-Wan, not, of course, Obi-Wan in the original episode four that came out in 1977, but the younger version that was part of the first three prequel movies, one through three. Sure. So the miniseries is set during the the dark times. That would be after the third film, if we're going chronologically and not by release date. So Revenge of the Sith. It's set approximately 10 years after that. So nine years before the original film, A New Hope. So we are firmly back in the time of the Empire. The Republic has fallen. The Jedi Order has been wiped out. Uh, it's bad times all around. Obi-Wan is currently hiding on Tatooine, keeping tabs on a young Luke Skywalker, whom we all know will grow up to be the great hero of the original trilogy. And there's this organization within the Empire with these characters called Inquisitors. And they are basically Jedi hunters. Well, one of these Inquisitors hatches a plan to draw Obi-Wan out of hiding. And that plan involves kidnapping the daughter of one of Obi-Wan's old associates from the Fallen Republic. And of course, that associate is Bail Organa, played here by Jimmy Smits, that fans of the prequels will recognize. And that daughter is none other than a young Princess Leia, played by Vivian Lyra Blair. So that's really the inciting incident in this miniseries, the thing that gets the ball rolling on the story. Obi-Wan goes to rescue Leia and is caught up in this trap. So it's really interesting for, you know, the this particular universe, as I mentioned, it keeps growing. And I think the reason why we cover something like this is, frankly, there are fans out there that almost treat this like a religion. There is so much minutia that they know about. But I want to just keep kind of digging into this character because it's really an important character in the Star Wars arc. So I want you to tell us a little bit more about Obi-Wan Kenobi. And as I mentioned, everyone's probably heard of him, even if they haven't watched all the films. And he's a pretty major player in the Star Wars mythology since the very beginning. So can you give us a little bit of the backstory of the character in particular and what his legacy is? And why do you think people are interested in this character? Why is he once a character that kind of endures that people want to know more about? Yeah, so 
The role originated with Sir Alec Guinness back in the original 1977 film when it was just called Star Wars. It's arguably Guinness's most famous role, which ironically enough irked him. Uh, considering his credits, so the story goes, he wanted to be remembered for much better films and more nuanced characters. But the widespread appeal of Star Wars sort of solidified him as Obi-Wan in people's minds. And he ended up reprising the character as one of the, the Force ghosts throughout the original trilogy. So he never really walked away from the role, just grew tired of it, sort of like Harrison Ford a bit. And because Star Wars was conceived as a bit of a modern mythology, by George Lucas's own ad admission, there are very clear archetypes that the characters slot into, at least in that original film. And Obi-Wan in A New Hope plays the role of the wise old mentor figure. He would essentially be the Merlin to Luke's Arthur or the Gandalf to Luke's Frodo. So for a, a long time, Obi-Wan was this older, almost mystical figure who spoke in half-truths and proverbs. But when Lucas made the prequels, where he went back and wanted to show sort of like the, the twilight of the Jedi era to, to develop the stories around what was called the Clone Wars in the original uh, film. Uh, Obi-Wan was recast, uh, much younger now, and he was played by Ewan McGregor. Now, the prequels are often lambasted for their shoddy acting, but the truth is, McGregor is one of the best decisions Lucas made when it came to casting. Not only does he bear a kind of resemblance to a young Alec Guinness, but he nails his interpretation of the character, and, and he has talked at length in interviews and different behind-the-scenes documentaries about finding all these little nuances that Guinness brought to the role and sort of mimicking those or playing off those you get the very real sense that you're watching a younger version of the character that Alec Guinness originated. And I think you get a lot of mileage out of that in terms of audience response to the character. But you also have to take into account the fact that Kenobi just has some of the best character work in the entire series. There are a lot of really divisive opinions out there about certain characters in Star Wars. And in my experience... Obi-Wan is not one of them. Uh, everybody seems to like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's, he's sort of the perfect embodiment of the Jedi way, if we want to call it that. He's completely selfless. He endures great suffering and hardship without really wavering too badly or giving in to anger. And in an age where even our superheroes are either morally compromised in some way or are quite shallow, a, a truly good character like Obi-Wan tends to stand out. As a writer, that old adage comes to mind that it's always easier to write evil and it's always harder to write goodness well. And I, I think you see that on a large scale by what our culture exports. It's, it's almost lazy writing to constantly have certain characters make a morally compromising decision for the sake of dramatic effect. And the harder thing is to write a character who maintains their goodness throughout a narrative. And Obi-Wan is one of those rare characters who maintains his goodness throughout his life, really. And I think that appeals to people. Clearly, it appeals to people. D didn't this miniseries upon launch attract like these record-breaking numbers for Disney Plus? Is that right? I don't know, but I can imagine it was one that I had read was really people were looking forward to it quite a bit, and it was delayed because of the pandemic. And as you said, Obi-Wan is... A character that's universally liked. I can't think of a lot of criticism of the character itself. I remember reading pretty early on when the series launched, at least that first episode. I'm I'm pretty sure it was it, it attracted record breaking numbers uh, for, for the streaming platform. So so there's clearly an appeal there. So this is one of the shorter mini series. It seems to be like a trend these days, specifically for Disney Plus, whether it's the Marvel Universe or the Star Wars Universe, for example. But they're doing these short little six episode arcs that are live action. And in spite of the fact that it's only six episodes, this series does take Obi-Wan on this emotional journey. And so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, his arc 
over these six episodes and the significance of that. And probably, you know, there's people out there that think this character's story is really done and there's no real reason to kind of mine it anymore. Sure. So when the series begins, we find Obi-Wan in a bit of a slump. He's living in a cave on this backwater planet of Tatooine, doing what he can to get by. He's pretty much shed the moniker of Obi-Wan entirely and now has this very simple alias, uh, Ben, which of course is a nod to the name Luke will know him by in the original film. And anyone who knows the trajectory of the story up to this point, you'll know that this is the first time we're encountering the character since he battled his former friend and apprentice, Anakin Skywalker, at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Now, Obi-Wan believes that he killed Anakin and for 10 years has been living with this guilt that he somehow failed not just the Jedi, but really the galaxy of sorts, allowing the Republic to fall and the Empire to rise. He's completely cut off from the Force and maintains the lowest of profiles, even from Luke. Uh, his, only, his only real contact with Luke is mediated through Owen Lars, Luke's uncle and Anakin's stepbrother. And, and I just, I have to point this out very quickly, uh, but I was absolutely taken with Joel Edgerton's portrayal of Owen. I have a couple of friends who are pretty major Star Wars fans, and we have a, a group chat we were texting in throughout the series. And one of the things we all latched on to was Joel Edgerton's interpretation of Owen Lars. It was just unexpectedly good, and I would certainly like to see more of that character. Anyway, Owen is Obi-Wan's proxy when it comes to Luke. But after Leia is kidnapped and Obi-Wan is drawn out of hiding, uh, Obi-Wan learns that Anakin is still alive and the emotional stakes are raised because now he knows that he's never going to be able to move past this, that he's going to have to confront Anakin again. So the show is only six episodes, but it gets a lot of mileage out of Obi-Wan's internal conflict, this emotional story arc. Um, in fact, it really is the best part of the show. Is the character going to be able to not only confront this major source of unresolved conflict in his life, but he's going is, is he going to be able to forgive himself for what he perceives as being his own failures in the end? And that's really the heart of the show. Obi-Wan coming to terms with the knowledge of who Vader is and finding a means of letting go and accepting things as they are and forgiving himself in spite of his own shortcomings. So that's sort of the emotional journey that Obi-Wan goes through in the miniseries. You were just talking about forgiveness. So I want to ask you a little bit more about that in the context of this particular show. And it's something that probably Christians will, you know, tune into and thinking through about it, like they'll see what's happening here. So I'm just wondering, you know, something happens, like you said, he thinks he's killed Darth Vader previously, and it's kind of haunting him. And he has to get to a point without too many spoilers, where he realizes he's not responsible for something that's happened to cause Anakin to go to the dark side and become Lord Vader. So how should Christians react to that? Because they see this situation in which Obi-Wan is saying he has to forgive himself for doing, not really being part of this. Like, oh, okay, yes, I did fight him, but I have to let go of that. So I have to forgive myself for what happened to this guy to cause him to become a bad guy. I mean, I want to be careful here because it kind of sounds like, I don't know, Freudian counseling or something like that. Some kind of self-help thing, love yourself or forgive yourself. Is there any kind of spiritual, like biblical value for that in this kind of a situation? Um, yeah, this is pretty interesting in light of the series. And and I I want to I want to push the envelope further a bit and and say that, you know, though Obi-Wan kind of learns that he he's not what we'd say directly responsible for for Vader, that there are a lot of small compromises that are made throughout the way that he, he's, he also is aware of. Some of those are, are explored, I would say, in, in the series The Clone Wars, for anyone who has watched that. But there, there, it's not... My point is that there's not one 
major moment where Obi-Wan, um, you know, sort of makes a, a, a terrible mistake, but they're just small compromises, things that could have been done differently. And that's, that's kind of the stuff that that's haunting him, but he does have to let go of one big one in particular. And to talk about this in the context of just life, you know, here's the thing. I, I don't want to, to minimize the offense of people who have sinned greatly and know that they have sinned greatly, but I feel as though those people are often the target of these kinds of talks. Now, let me let me nuance what I'm saying in this way. One of my many jobs uh, <laughs> is that I work with felons, men who are coming out of prison. I've always found that the murderers, for example, the people whom we would say have done something close to irredeemable, carry their guilt well. And what I mean by that is that chances are, now this is not a blanket approach here, this is just my experience. They have received this kind of counseling more readily than others for obvious reasons. It might seem counterintuitive at first, but because of the magnitude of their crime, they are the easy target, the low-hanging fruit when it comes to absolution, let's say. The people I encounter who tend to not carry their guilt as well are people who have made a lifetime of small, unsexy compromises that have led them to dark places. Most of the felons I've worked with who have done something as horrendous as taking another life, most, not all, but most of them, were found to have committed that crime in a moment of passion, the heat of the moment, if you will, a terrible decision made in a moment of unbridled rage. The people I always find it harder to reach in terms of helping them to forgive themselves are the people who have made error after error after error over time, however small. They're usually addicts of some kind. And what I'm saying here really isn't novel. I mean, there's been a ton of ink spilled by psychologists and other professionals on the absolute black hole spiral that is addiction, whatever form it takes, drugs, gambling, sex, alcohol you know, you name it, it it all sorts, sort of plays in the same ballpark. And then you throw in the guilt and the self-loathing and that compounds with the need for a high and it's just a never-ending cycle defined primarily by self-hatred. And as a Christian, while there is absolutely a purpose to guilt and a need for a sense of trespass, if you find that you're being constrained by those things, chances are you're missing a critical, critical component of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, the law is important. The law reveals to humans their sin, but the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law. And the struggle with the Jews of the first century who converted to Christianity was very real when it came to this particular realization. Uh, It's what prompted Paul to write in Romans, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, none of mankind will be justified in his sight. Through the law comes knowledge of sin, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. That's Romans 3. The Christian is uniquely aware of his or her own trespass, but the point of the gospel free you from that guilt so that you live not burdened by sin and free of its consequence. And I'll tell you, as someone who has made more than his fair share of small and unsexy mistakes, If you don't let that reality come to define you, you will eat yourself up. It's always the mark of someone who is a narcissist when they cannot forgive themselves because the focus is so inwardly turned. They have yet to truly die to themselves because they're essentially saying, God might forgive me, but I won't. In some ways, it's it's very twisted. And there is no easy way to deal with that. But it has to be confronted, and we have to die to ourselves, and we must come to accept the teachings of Scripture, which is that because of your faith, because of what you believe, you are no longer defined by sin, and death is not your end. And, Christian, if you have never heard that, then why do you believe what you believe? This was a critical point for the Apostle Paul. It was a huge topic of debate in the early church. It's right there in Scripture. So this is not the shallow self-help drivel of learning to love your flaws or whatever garbage that entails, but this is a very real sense of your sins are forgiven, now live like it. So yes, I think this is a very important point that this series sort of gets into, obviously not from the Christian standpoint per se, 
But from a character perspective, Obi-Wan sees a lot of these little compromises throughout his life as leading up to the rise of the Empire and the destruction of the Jedi, and he holds himself responsible for that. The emotional arc of the series is him coming to terms with his own failures, but also recognizing that he can't take all the blame. That's the, the huge moment in his final confrontation with Vader in that last episode. He's gone the whole time blaming himself for what happened to Anakin. He simply wants to apologize. He, it's almost like he needs Anakin's forgiveness. But in that final exchange between them, Vader tells him, you didn't do this, I did. You didn't kill Anakin, I did. And it's, it's almost demonic, the degree of emotional cannibalism that goes on with Vader. But his words ironically end up freeing Obi-Wan. And when Obi-Wan lands on that realization that, at least for now, Vader is Anakin's suicide, if you will, he simply walks away. There's no more emotional conflict it's resolved. And I sort of think what, what has hindered the series is that this, this rematch between Vader and Obi-Wan has been hyped up in the promotional material and even by the, the executives. But when you watch the show, the conflict isn't between Obi-Wan and Vader at all, it's between Obi-Wan and himself. And so when, when that emotional conflict is resolved, he just, he walks away and it's over. And I think that's a, a very profound, I think it's a very adult and mature approach to telling a, a story. That, that's the crux of the issue, I think. It's been a while since I've talked about the giveaway that we've had for the first half of 2022, but we did have a giveaway going on even during the time when we were not mentioning it. But there are two entries only. So we have 3745 The Red and Frank C. Shipani, both of who had put comments into the Apple Podcast section, and that's how you enter to win. So let's spin the wheel and see who won all the swag, including a free subscription to the Christian Research Journal. Well, it looks like the winner is Frank C. Shapani. There are only two entries, so the chances are really good that one of them would win. So Frank, if you are listening to this promo part of the podcast, congratulations to you. How you claim your prize is that you go to the website to email us and just email us from your email address so we can get all your information. That's webmaster at equip.org. Again, webmaster at equip.org. And we'll give you a couple of episodes to claim your prize. If we don't hear from Frank, then the automatic runner-up winner will be the other entry from 3745 The Red. So thank you to both of those people for putting in some comments to our Apple podcast page. And that's the way in which people can find this podcast. And we want more and more comments to be in there. We only have 71 ratings or reviews total, and we would love to be at least 100 or more than 100. So we're hoping that people will continue to put in some comments there for us. We will run another giveaway, but it'll be sometime later this month, and I will announce what that will be, and that will close at the end of the year. Well, anyway, we thank you so much for your ongoing partnership with this, especially if for the first time you subscribed and helped us out with our fiscal year end at that very special rates that we had for journal subscriptions. In the meantime, if you missed that and didn't already subscribe, please do so at equip.org. Of course, a subscription, you get the journal straight to your door, plus you get all the access to our online exclusives, and we have a few that are coming up including a review of the new Disney Plus Star Wars series, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So thank you for your support. You can always drop us a tip. If a subscription is not in your budget, go to equip.org to do that as well and hit the journal tab. So now back to the podcast. Well, now I want to talk to you a little bit about Darth Vader because that is a huge character in the Star Wars universe. This is a spoiler, so if you haven't already seen the series and want to, you should stop now and come back to this podcast after you've watched it. But the big reveal was that James Earl Jones returned to voice Darth Vader as he had started voicing Vader back in the 1970s. And of course, Hayden Christensen 
um, is playing Vader um, under the mask, as well as there's a, some flashback episodes and you can kind of see part of his face disfigured in one of the scenes. And so he was, of course, young Anakin Skywalker back in episodes one through three in the films. And so what do you think that Vader, particularly in the miniseries in particular, why do you think Darth Vader continues to just resonate with audiences, even though it seems like his story is complete? We know what happens to Vader, of course, in the movie, in the sixth movie out of the first nine films. So we kind of know. I mean, we all, you know, if anyone has any familiarity at all with Star Wars, even just the films, you kind of know going into this series, well, what some of the main characters, what their fate is, whether it's Princess Leia or Darth Vader or Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. So in, in this particular miniseries, the way that Vader is used is, is pretty interesting. I think on a, a very surface and shallow level, audiences just like to see, you know, a character do cool things and, and Vader does a lot of cool stuff. But when you when you excavate that for just a second and you look at the role that Vader plays in this particular story, he really is the singular source of all of Obi-Wan's unresolved emotional trauma. And so, you know, it's not, again, it's a mistake to sort of characterize the conflict of this series as Obi-Wan against Vader, even though that's a lot of the promotional material. The real emotional conflict is, is within Obi-Wan, and Vader sort of represents all of that. That's, that's why the series sort of has Vader turning up, uh, not maybe uh, it, in, in what we might call s- traditional plot structure beats, but in emotional story beats. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting yin and yang uh, to, to him and Obi-Wan because he's, he's playing off of Obi-Wan's emotional low points, and that, that's really sort of interesting. Um, as far as why this character continues to captivate audiences beyond that, that surface level, you know, he's, he's, he just, he looks cool doing stuff. I I think this is the first series, uh, that really, apart from the comics and some of the books, which have done this for a while, but this is the first time on screen that we've really, really been able to excavate, uh, Vader's psychology outside of some of the animated stuff. And when you get down to it, I mean, Vader is truly a head case. I think I characterized it earlier as it's emotional cannibalism. And and it's this very bracing psychodrama that plays out. That's just, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, you, from the perspective of the villain, if, if you're looking at this from Vader's perspective, the moment where he sort of takes all of Kenobi's self-flagellation over, you know, the, the death of Anakin and throws it back in his face, it, it's Vader's most triumphant moment. There's something so sinister and spot on in the portrayal and that's haunting that you buy it, that you, you buy that this personality, this persona, this being who is now more machine than human murdered the man who was Anakin Skywalker. You, you buy that. And, and it makes the, honestly, it makes the emotional arc in the original trilogy that much more powerful because Luke, that's, that's his son, is the last person in the galaxy absolutely committed to redeeming this guy, never compromising the belief that Vader could always come back to the light. And when you when you see glimpses of just how far gone we should say Vader seems to be in a series like Kenobi, to know where his story ends and to know that his his final moments are are in coming back to the light, it's it's powerful stuff. It's it's the stuff of myth. It's idealized, sure, but that's uh, that that's the power of story. And uh, Vader is is easily. I think cinema's most iconic villain. I think you might be able to debate in terms of uh, how well the character is written if he's if he's cinema's greatest villain because at the end of the day he he sort of is more of an anti-hero. He comes back. But that being said, I I definitely think this Vader is is easily the most iconic villain put to screen, created solely for screen. Everybody recognizes him. He's very striking. It's a very it's an immediately recognizable, not only image, but silhouette. You, you, you know, you know, Vader. 
and uh, to to be able to really get into the character's ideology is is fascinating. Again, it's just it it's it's very bizarre and it's a bracing psychodrama when you have this this man who is very clearly Anakin Skywalker sitting there saying Anakin Skywalker is dead. I killed him. <laughs> this uh, it, it's you buy that it's just this whole new persona, this whole new person that's there. And it's uh, it's it's interesting stuff. Now, I always ask you this when we cover any kind of television show or film or novel or something like that. You know, why would the Christian apologist even care about continuing on with Star Wars past the first film that, you know, iconic 1977 film? I mean, why would Christians watch this series or even care to talk to other people about it? Is there something about it that's significant for the Christian apologist to consider? Yeah, Star Wars is probably one of the easier ones to pick on uh, along these lines, just because everybody watches Star Wars. Again, I'm pretty sure this show broke uh, some some streaming records when it, it, the first episode launched. At least everybody watches it. So if 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 you're do- if you're talking about cultural apologetics, the Christian who is wanting to engage the culture, uh, if, if you want to keep a finger on the pulse of where the culture is. Star Wars is the property to do that with. I mean, Marvel is in a sense a flash in the pan. I, I think it's kind of it, it's a product of its time and it's short lived. You know, Star Wars has been around since the seventies and isn't going away anytime soon. Um, so, in in that sense, I think it's a very good idea to keep your eye on the ball, so to speak, if you're wanting to track what the culture is turning to for entertainment. The other thing is that uh, kids are attracted to Star Wars um, by and large. You know, we, we've talked about that in, in different capacities. But if, if you're wanting to to sort of know what all your kids' friends are going to be talking about, chances are, again, keep your eye on Star Wars and, and you'll see it. But if we're asking, does the show have any serious apologetic value? Now, you know, depending on what you're wanting to emphasize, you're going to get different mileage out of it. I mean, the classic debate for Christians in Star Wars is the nature of the Force, and is that conducive to a Christian worldview? And you know, it's kind of like Buddhism and all of that stuff. And look, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's a story, right? You, you you're not going to mine this stuff for one to one compatibility. This is not Narnia. This is not C.S. Lewis doing an allegory, but it does rely on mythic tropes. And we have talked at length in multiple other podcasts about the importance of mythic storytelling and why these archetypes are significant images, if nothing else. Um, it was an, a, a love of myth and mythic storytelling that converted C.S. Lewis, to um, or I should say that led to his conversion. Reading George MacDonald, sorry, reading George MacDonald's Fantasties is what Lewis would say baptized his imagination. So there, there is a, a very real sense in which... Star Wars captures almost everyone in their childhood as it's designed to do, and then it sticks with you. And by Lucas's own admission, what Star Wars was meant to do was instill what he called a baseline morality, um, a sort of modern mythology. Um, so you have this idea of the light side, dark side, good and evil. So are there are there entry points for a Christian apologist into... Um, a dis- in- into discussions about philosophy, theology even. In Star Wars, yeah, yeah, they're all over the place. It's mythic. It's designed to be that way. But more importantly, this miniseries, uh, to, to, to sort of put a fine point on things, are there entry points for the Christian apologists in this miniseries? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it. You, when, you, when you look at how Obi-Wan deals with guilt, which is the crux of the show, the, Christ- <laughs> the Christian has probably more to say about that than most people. And what you you sort of are, are freed from and released from when you convert. So yes, I think there are, are several natural inroads for the Christian apologist into discussions about faith uh, using this show specifically as, as a springboard, of course. Well, we have talked about before, just personally in terms of should we cover something or not, just kind of the backstory of different franchises and specifically this one. I mean, at the very beginning, George Lucas envisioned 
the series of films. I think even in the 80s, he said it was going to be nine films. And I guess after the first six, we thought it was finished and done. But of course, the last three films have come along more recently. And now that particular story arc of that sequel trilogy is is finished. And so now there's the exploration of Star Wars in television, which has been happening with other uh, Disney properties like the Clone Wars and so forth. But Um, I was wondering even if there were differences in philosophy between the different periods of uh, when George Lucas owned it and now that Disney owns it. And, you know, he was just himself and he had very much control of the story. And now that it's owned by Disney, some of those mythic tropes that you were talking about, some of that mythic storytelling that is very evident in the sequel trilogy, is that still continuing it? Or do you think it will continue in these new iterations under Disney, which is a completely different, I guess, even, I mean, now we're going to deep Star Wars nerd territory, but things that had happened in books and comic books, some of that Disney scrapped and said they were no longer part of the canon of Star Wars until Disney introduces certain themes and they do go back and pull some characters in like Poe Dameron or just different things that were in the comics and so forth. So just wondering if it's less mythic in terms of, you know, just some of that Eastern thought as the films were, for example, because Disney's just more about, you know, just telling their animated feel good stories, not so much Joseph Campbell, the power of myth type stuff. Yeah. So to answer the question about the the differences in philosophy, I, I think it's pretty obvious, but I, I kind of, you're right. This is sort of the the part where all the all the the Star Wars nerds really can can lean in, I guess, to, to this episode. But I, I do want to sort of set the record straight, I guess, on on a couple of things. If you read Bob Iger's biography, or I guess it's his autobiography, he talks about one of the regrets uh, had at, as the head of Disney is is how they handled the acquisition of Lucas's property, and according to the book, again, so you're. you're but it's coming from the horse's mouth, so you know, take it for what it is. There, there was apparently an issue when Disney acquired the rights to Star Wars that Lucas sold it under the impression that they were going to use Lucas's ideas to carry the story forward. And when things got shifted around and that didn't happen, apparently Lucas felt somewhat slighted by it, which is sort of reflected, I think, in that interview. Um, with that he gave that legendary interview he gave with Charlie Rose where he likened Disney to, to white slavers and caught some some flack for that. At the end of the day, there's a lot of material that's been published in recent years over you know George's outlines for the series and kind of what he wanted to do with it. And I will say that you know love or hate the sequel trilogy, a lot of the story beats, I would say most of the narrative beats followed Lucas's outlines. I mean the characters got shifted around and the specific details, you know, got, got moved. But in terms of where the story was going to go with at least the legacy characters, Luke, Han, Leia, most of that stuff I would say is, is still intact. So, you know, everybody likes to, to jump on Disney and say, well, well, you know, Disney ruined Star Wars. Well, (laughs) the truth is it's, it's a little more complex than that and a little more nuanced. And unless you're, you're actually in there making those creative decisions, you probably don't know you know, the pieces that are going into it. But from a a broad approach, this is what I think is interesting now that the sequel trilogy is complete and we're firmly in this era of Star Wars television. You can sort of look back and say, okay, what are the philosophical differences between Star Wars under Lucas when it was independent and now Star Wars under Disney? I do think that losing, losing George, you lose a lot of the the coherent narrative vision. Uh, a lot of the the earlier Star Wars stuff, the originals and, and the prequels, it, it's sort of like, you know, this this grown-up kid inviting you into his his room to, to play with his action figures. And, you know, the, the story, you get different, to varying degrees of success, the story is told. It feels unique. It feels like the product of a singular creative imagination with a lot of what Disney has done, and this shouldn't really come as any surprise, a lot of it has been, it's corporate now. And I think even in my uh, review of the show Kenobi that I wrote, I, personally, I don't think 
there has been another Star Wars um, series since Disney acquired it that has felt more like it was filtered through so many different hands and just had the input of so many different creative entities than Obi-Wan. And it really feels like a, like a patchwork. I think it's a very disjointed show. Um, I think it makes some very baffling creative decisions when there are much more simpler and obvious answers staring the creatives right in the face. Um, and maybe those would have been made had it not just kept receiving input. And in the interviews that have come out with the uh, original uh, writer of the, the screenplay, because it, it was a movie before it was a miniseries, it sounds like there was just a bunch of rewriting that happened um, and, a, and a patchwork was created. It was. It feels like this, what should have been a two-hour movie or a three-hour miniseries was stretched out over six episodes with all this other sort of non-essential stuff thrown in that complicates things. And that's kind of what it feels like. So I, I definitely think you can see a difference in, um, in core philosophies. But now that the sequel trilogy is done, and the sequel trilogy I don't think is as bad as people make out to be, but now that the sequel trilogy is done, I think Star Wars as a as it is under Disney, is at a point of having to redefine what it is and what it's about. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see where they go with it. I think they're, they have some uh, uh, interesting ideas floating. I know that the series Andor is about to come out and uh, has a very, very good writer attached to it. I, I love the writer. Um, he wrote Michael Clayton, which is you know, one, of, one of my favorite films, if, if not, you know, maybe in my top three. So I'm interested in seeing where it goes, but uh, certainly, certainly different philosophies and things are far more, I guess, corporate now than they were before. Earlier in this podcast, you talked about, you know, Star Wars. If you want to know what your kids are watching, you know, look at Star Wars because kids are watching Star Wars. And in your article, you, you specifically say that, you know, George Lucas who created Star Wars always it intended it, you know, for basically tweens, I mean, for 12 year olds. But again, there are a lot of diehard fans, and I mentioned this at the beginning, who almost look at this universe like a religion, kind of similar to like Star Trek fans, who just get down to the complete minutiae about the series. And they feel very strongly about Star Wars. And their fan base is quite has a reputation, I would say, almost a, a legendary reputation to being very divisive and, and very passionate. So why do you think, you know, on one hand, George Lucas is saying this is something that should be for kids for 12 year olds. And then on the other hand, I know somebody who's um, in their 20s and literally they could probably write a PhD dissertation on Star Wars. If I have a question and ask them about Star Wars, I get a probably, you know, 15 minute answer to one simple question about a character or some kind of story plot. So what about this particular series that really galvanizes people? I mean, it really captures people. You mentioned, you know, Marvel might be a flash in the pan. There's so many different Marvel series. There's so many different characters. But somehow the characters of Star Wars really resonate with people, not just now, but just through the decades. I mean, since 1977. And why do its fans tend to be almost at a religious level. And, you know, you know, you just mentioned this series feels a little bit disjointed to you. How do we reconcile some of the new stuff coming out, which we have um, reviewed on this podcast? If our listeners have min uh, missed some of the previous ones that we've done, we have covered both The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett. But how do we reconcile some of these new Disney Plus series with Lucas just saying, hey, this is supposed to be almost like a fairy tale for kids. It's, it's, it's for kids. Yeah, that, that's a good way to say it. I mean, it is a fairy tale for kids. Uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away is is George Lucas's version of Once Upon a Time. Simple as that. Um, but I, I think there's there's something to be said uh, for the fact that people come to this as children and it captures them in very profound ways. Sort of like what I think happened to to Lewis. Um, and his, his love of mythology, because that's really what Star Wars is. I mean, Lucas even says he wanted to create a baseline morality, uh, sort of a modern mythology in that sense. And uh, the reason I think you, you liken it to, to almost, you know, religious devotion. And I think it's because mythology plays in those realms. And a lot of your great 20th century Christian thinkers and writers realize that Tolkien, Lewis, Charles Williams, among others, um, 
that it, there's a there is a connection between uh, mythological ideas and religious you know ideology. And we, we've talked before again at length on other podcasts that what, what we what we mean when we talk about mythology, it's not you know we're not saying when we say Genesis is mythic, what we're not saying is that you know it didn't happen. It's it, the, the myth. The word myth has has really lost its its full essence, and we're talking about this in, in the oldest sense of of the word and the truest sense of the word. Um, so I don't I don't want to beat that dead horse too much, but I, I think it, it that's why it captures people, especially uh, as uh, as children and they carry that with them into, into adulthood and that, you know, people tend to just feel very strongly about it. Um, when stuff gets changed or moved around to recontextualize, uh, had, in terms of how we reconcile what Lucas's original intent was to tell these stories that were meant for, for 12 year olds is what he said. I think the films have done a very good job of, remaining that way. I, I sort of, my big secret when it comes to Star Wars is that I sort of think that every older generation is supposed to hate the new stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, the original series fans hated the prequels. Well, now my generation, what we'd call millennials, grew up with the prequels. And, you know, we're now, people my age are now, you know, the movie critics and stuff like that. And they look back on the prequels fondly. When, you know, 20 years ago, everybody hated the prequels, it seemed. So I sort of think this is just the way the generations are supposed to turn that, you know, the original series generation hated the prequels. The prequel series generations is going to hate the sequels. And, you know, the, the kids who grew up with the sequels, you know, when they're my age, are going to look back on it and think Ray, Poe and Finn are as, as cool as Luke, Han and Leia. And I'm going to think they're nuts for it. <laughs> St stuff like that. So I, I actually think that's kind of uh, the secret sauce of Star Wars is that it, it's generational, the, at least the films are. And that that does uh, sort of interest me. But the the series especially are, are sort of doing these more adult things. Like there are the Mandalorian. I don't think there's anything in it that a kid can't watch in the same way with Boba Fett. Although there there's some things in, in Boba Fett I watch. I think hmm. <laughs> it's a little a little uh, on, on the nose and, and kind of right there in your face. But when you look at uh, something like Obi-Wan, which I would say is, is a very mature show, I, I can't I can't imagine a, a kid watching Obi-Wan and being able to grasp what's happening, especially when Obi-Wan walks away from Vader there at the end. Maybe they can, um, but they're not going to certainly get, get the fullness of that. And, you know, maybe they're not supposed to. But... This kind of plays into what I said a second ago, where Star Wars is at a point where it's going to have to, as a property, decide where it's going to go. And I was talking with someone fairly recently about this after Obi-Wan came out, especially about the whole being for kids. And the, the point the individual I was talking to made is, you know, Lucas has the right to define what he wanted Star Wars to be, but it's no longer his. He sold it. So now someone else has to define what Star Wars is. And I think there's some truth to that. However, I, I, what I batted back at him was, but when you, when you step away from authorial intent, as we would call it in hermeneutics and Bible studies, uh, when you step away from what Lucas intended Star Wars to be and start doing different types of stories, even if they're good stories for adults and stuff like that, do you begin to lose the essence of what Star Wars is? Are you still talking about Star Wars or are you talking about something else entirely or something like Star Wars, but isn't quite what it it's sort of meant to be? And I think those are uh, discussions that can, can turn subjective, but I, for one, hope Star Wars, at least in its films, I think the TV shows are an interesting experiment, but I hope that the films never waver from being targeted for, from targeting that, that, uh, you know, childhood, childhood fantasy and, and working, uh, in with, with children. We'll see. I think, uh, there, there's a lot of, a lot of decisions that have to be made from the executives in, in terms of, uh, deciding where Star Wars goes from here. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have a fun summertime question for Cole. We ask these questions. They are a little bit silly, but we ask them so our, our readers can get to know some of our authors a little bit better. So it's summer, Cole, watermelon or corn on the cob? Um, watermelon. Well, thanks, Cole, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me.
You've been listening to episode 295 of the Postmodern Realities podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Cole Burgett, one of our contributing writers, and he has written an online exclusive television series review for the Journal of the Disney Plus series, Obi-Wan Kenobi. His article is called Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Freedom of Forgiveness. Our subscribers can read his web exclusive review at our website equip.org if you don't already subscribe and you'd like to read the review go to equip.org to subscribe and thank you for listening to the podcast Mm -hmm.